Welcome to the Beyond Jiu Jitsu podcast. This is episode number 69. Never get your guard passed. Guard retention for white belts. Imagine that. Imagine never getting passed. My name's Adam Childs, sitting across from Kieran Lefebvre. Yo, yo. We're going to teach you how to never get passed. And if you get passed, it wasn't our fault. You suck. No. Well, if anything, <laughs> it was your fault, Adam. I am the listener. <laughs> you are the, the teacher. You are the master. I mean, what are you talking about? Your guard's popping off. Yeah. Come on now. This is the perfect yep. opportunity for the 20 birds. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. The infamous sound, soundboard. Yeah. So, I mean, I've been working on guard a little bit last last month. I dedicated to working on guard. Um, I don't think I really got enough time, enough reps in there. So after this comp that's coming up, yes, I have another comp uh, coming up on the 20th of March. Uh, I think this episode may air after that, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, so after the comp, I'm going to go back to guard and, and sort my guard out a little bit. I mean, it's come it's come a little bit of a way, but it's definitely not where I want it. Yeah, it takes a long time, right? It's uh, the, <clears throat> the difficulty people have with guard in the beginning is that it's not super intuitive, right? You, as a beginner, if someone just says sort of, oh, man, like stay on top and hold them down, it, you know, you could go, oh, yeah, it resonates with most people. It's very similar to... You know, if you wrestled with your parents as a kid or if you grew up with siblings and you – or even, you know, roughhousing with other kids at school or whatever, being on top kind of makes sense. Whereas being on bottom, you know, like, for example, in kids' class, you have to – the first thing you kind of almost have to teach them when it comes to guard is that, no, no, you're not allowed to kick them, right? Because that's what people intuitive sort of do is yeah. – and even for adults sometimes you get someone who comes from having no experience – they don't watch MMA or anything. They don't really know anything about it. You'll be like, you know, you put them on their back and they just try to kick you. Yeah, you know? the up kick. Yeah. The face. <laughs> that, can, that can knock you the fuck out. There's awesome like <laughs> compilations on YouTube of like the, the best MMA up kick finishes and people just kicking fuckers from, the, from their back. Like yeah, straight sure. up heel to the face. What about like the, the pride days where – where you're allowed Ooh, to kick a downed the opponent. Soccer kick. The soccer yeah. kick Whoa. and like the stomps to the head on yeah. the ground. Brutal. That's brutal. That's rough. So that's rough. really rough. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's where Vandalay Silva really <laughs> shone. <laughs> that ruthless sort of. The running soccer kick. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not really needed, I, is it? No. Man, uh, you'd have to break your foot. Like if you soccer kick someone's skull. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I'd want to kick someone well, in Well, what is the average head weigh? It's like three to four kilos, right? It's yeah, like pretty heavy, know. hey. Yeah, yeah. Imagine like kicking a a three kilo. Just hypothetically, you say three kilo. Imagine kicking a three kilo like I don't know plate or something like a dumbbell, like a round, like a medicine ball, but it's like hard. It would yeah. suck. Yeah, it's quite a funny like uh, commercial. Have you seen that commercial where there's essentially a a, a concrete sphere or a rock or whatever, but it's like painted like a soccer ball. And um, and it starts rolling down a hill, and this guy's like, "Oh, chasing after it!" And then the the ball, like I know, the, not the ball, but like the concrete ball or whatever, hits a bump and gets launched in the air. And then this other dude's like, "Oh, yeah, he like yeah, jumps yeah. up to, to the header." To header yeah, then, I have seen that. And then on it YouTube. cuts out. It's yeah. something to do with like get your eyes checked. Oh <laughs> 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 uh, shit! Definitely not an Australian commercial. Our yeah. commercials suck. Yeah. But guard retention. So yeah, you're right. It's it's not as intuitive as like you know getting someone down and holding them down. But but yeah yeah. So oh, audio audio issues. I lost my. There we go. Stand by. I, I, I lost my headphones. Oh, we're back. Now we're back. So yeah, it's it's not super intuitive. Like you know fighting from your back. But I mean, the what has really put Brazilian Jiu Jitsu on the map and made it like infamous, particularly back in the days of of early UFC was that whole fighting from your back. The fact that you could finish someone in what was, you know, previously in other martial art, other grappling sports as a very inferior, weak, vulnerable position. Now all of a sudden it can be someone's strength. Yeah, people were like, close guard, what's this? Mm, exactly. Right. Now it's a, uh, you know, don't, don't end up there very often, but yeah, that that's right. It was the sort of people really had no idea the, in the early UFC days, the only person to really, give any trouble on the ground to hoist was um what's his name uh, ken shamrock because he was a yeah. wrestler yeah so obviously grappling in itself wasn't foreign to him but mm. submissions were 
I guess you could say. Mm. But yeah, so how do you take something that is not intuitive and make it intuitive? Well, firstly, it takes a lot of time. Okay, taking something that is, you know, trying to develop something that is not whatever natural and trying to make it autonomous obviously is a skill that takes many years to develop. But how do we start laying the groundwork for it? Well, the first thing to understand as, as a white belt who's struggling with your guard retention is understanding the, the position of being on your back and how you should statically be on your back. So what I mean by that is beginners don't understand the importance of keeping their knees to their shoulders, right? Like tucked in. It's like a guard. So you see, you see white belts always extend their legs too much. And then if your knees aren't pulled up to your shoulders, your chest is exposed. And we're ignoring submissions or back takes, if we're talking about getting your guard passed, that means the opponent gets to either side control or mount. Any other position, or knee on belly, sorry, you could say as well, any other position wouldn't technically be a guard pass. Them sitting back on a straight footlock, that's not a guard pass. Them, you know, taking your back, that's not a guard pass, right? So, you know, in all three of those positions, side control, knee on belly, and mount, your chest needs to ex be exposed, right? They're either getting their, you know, their hips, their knee, or their chest to your chest. So if you extend your legs away, right, like you're reaching for something that isn't there, not only are you exposing your chest, but you're also just doing a pretty much like a hollow body for no reason, like the ab exercise, right? So it doesn't make any sense, right? I always think about it like, like a boxer. You know, that's how I remember God was first explained to me. Maybe this is where my analogies came from. The very first time God was explained no to me, right? But, you know, I came from more, I don't want to say a striking background because like I'm not a striker. I but just you did, did have a- Yeah, I just did some Muay Thai, Muay Thai yeah. and stuff like that. And, you know, long legs I used to be when I was younger. I'm still kind of flexible, but I was even more flexible so I could kick really high and, you know- uh, I liked I liked doing that sort of stuff, but I never really w was a striker. I never got in the ring. It was all just like pad and bag work for fitness, I guess you could say. Uh, anyway, it, the idea of your guard is in your, like for a striker, made sense, you know? You, I think that's even more kind of intuitive maybe because it's more in the mainstream, like seeing boxers, you know, put their gloves up and their forearms in front of their face to to not get punched, right? And so that, that comparison was given to me in terms of my guard with my legs. It was like, well, like a boxer, it's what keeps you safe. So if you think a boxer doesn't walk around with their arms fully extended, right? Two reasons. A, you then have no like forearms, gloves, guard in front of your face to stop you getting punched in the face. And two, if your arms are already extended, how do you then throw a punch, right? And so your jujitsu guard is very similar. And again, where, you know, there's still going to be things in here that I would assume resonate with higher belts, but I am going to try keep it very sort of, you know, simplistic because it's the, the idea is it to be more targeted towards beginners. But think about think about it like that. Your your guard is the same. Your knee, unless you're throwing a punch, so to speak, there is no reason for your legs to be extended away from your chest, right? Your knees should be to your chest when you're lying flat on your back. Obviously, yeah. Oh, what about sit up guard? All what this about stuff. Spider guard. Yeah, what okay. about spider guard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm not. I'm just giving you very broad strokes. We're talking because, concepts here. Yeah, there are a million what ifs, mm -hmm. right, in jujitsu, and everyone, every gym has one guy, <coughs> Harry, right? Harry, one of, the, one of our blue, blue belt. belts, likes to ask a lot of questions. I hate to admit, but I was a bit of a what ifer as well. Not, not in a you know, I don't believe this would work, but more, you know, I just wanted to know all the answers. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm just, it's a very broad, sorry, if you're flat on your back, you know, these are simple tips you can implement to help your guard, knees to your chest, right? So that's the first thing. And uh, that alone connects to a, a whole bunch of other more advanced uh, guard retention concepts and, and then 
those being connected to techniques like, I don't know, a bearing bolo or whatever else you want to do. So the concept that you were talking about there, protecting your chest, even that resonated with me almost immediately. Like I was, as, as you were talking through, like using it, you know, the analogy of the boxing and then bringing back to the protecting your chest, it really makes sense when, when you think about what you were saying, like the goal of someone passing is to get chest to chest, hips to chest or knee to chest, right? Yeah. Everything is to effectively pass your legs and penetrate that that space in between your your hip and your neck, which is your you know your belly and chest area. Yeah. Therefore, you need to protect that area. What is the best way to protect that area on your back? Well, it's not going to necessarily be your arms because they're not as strong as half of your body, your legs. <laughs> yeah. Right. Your legs, your hips. And your, what does what does Danaher say? Like, why would you ignore fifty percent of your body? It's yeah, turned yeah. into a meme, and it's like turned into like a sexual thing, and people are always memeing on fucking Danaher right. taking the piss, like, like. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Danaher dating and he says to the chick, he's like, well, why would you ignore 50% of the of the body or something like that? <laughs> like trying to make it sexual. It's hilarious. I'm, I'm not doing it justice, but you know, people out there probably know what I'm talking about. It's very funny. Um, but no, it, it does make sense, right? So your legs are the strongest part of your body compared to your arms. So yeah, I, use your legs to protect your vulnerable chest. Yeah. And a uh, bit of related but unrelated. I don't know if this is true, actually. This is just one of those things I've heard, but I think it- Right, Joe Rogan. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I heard it once, therefore it's factual. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't know, it makes sense to me, right? That, so I've been told, like, and I tell this to when women get into jujitsu, and if, especially if they, you know, say, oh, for self-defense or whatever, and I try to explain to them the importance of guard and why it's so good, for for women is because it I don't want to say tips the scales in their favor, but it evens out the scales uh, because I once heard that apparently, and again, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I heard that that power to weight ratio wise, women in their legs and hips are just as strong as men. And in their legs. Yeah. Like like power to weight ratio if you have the same, you know. I'd push like, back on that because if you look at like um if you weight match power lifters, like you say the um eighty kilo division for women versus eighty kilo division for men, men's numbers will be like twenty five percent heavier. Yeah, but do you only use your legs when you weight lift? No, like squat, for example. If you look at like power yeah, lifting, but how like much squat, how, how much deadlift. how much of a heavy squat is like is like your lower back as well? Yeah, it could be your posterior chain, but like you would have to look, shut up. Let me Let, tell my let's story. Look at, let's look Let at me. leg press then like something that eliminates lower back. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd push back on that, but it, it does make sense that well, women okay. have very strong Let's legs. say maybe not as strong point being Sorry. because <laughs> due to, due to women being built for childbirth, they typically have very strong wider hips, hips yeah, wider saying, hips. Yeah. Right. And very and strong cores. Ve and they're just very strong in that part of their body. Right. Yeah, they 100%. really are like, I bet you you've, been whether it's drilling or rolling or whatever you've trained for long enough to have been caught in the triangle of a one of the girls at the gym who would be lighter than you mm -hmm. bro their squeeze mm. like we, like on triangles and arm bars and any sort of position where you half guard where you want to like where they're squeezing their thighs together mm. chicks are so strong there. yeah their adductors are crazy strong man yeah. like i reckon by default stronger than most dudes mm. Like I've been in triangles of dudes who are my weight, closer to a hundred kilos, and their squeeze is not as strong as like the fifty kilo chick. Mm. Like I don't know, maybe it's in my head. Mm. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know, slightly off topic, but God, really good, strong legs. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, keeping keeping your knees to your chest, right? Uh, that I could go down a whole, you know, rest of the episode just talking about how why that's important, but. We're going to move on to some, something else. Okay. So now we've established that. What's the next thing? Look, so let's say you're lying. You're a white belt. You're lying mm. flat on your back and you're like, cool, Adam. I got my knees to my chest. Now what? Okay. Yes, you could sit up and go super offensive and sit up guard, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But let's just look at what happens next typically, which is the grip fight. Okay. Now, first off, the reason – Usually people sit up is 
because if you're going against an equally skilled partner, not often will you see at the professional level the guy just lying flat on his back, right? He'll usually sit up, right? But let's um, – and it'll make more sense in a second, but let's just say you're lying flat on your back, right? When that engagement first happens, the f- think the person passing, their hands are going to be within range of your legs, right? Mm-hmm because you're lying flat on your back, even with your knees tucked to your chest, like the first things that would come together would be their hands and your feet, right? Before your hands can reach them, okay? Unless you are upside down, right? <laughs> that, that's just the way we're built, okay? So you need to learn how to win the grip fight of feet versus hands because the strength of playing guard is that it's two arms and two legs against, you know, essentially two arms because the person on top, their feet are on the ground. Okay. The, the, the pros of being on top is that, well, gravity's on your side and you know, you can be more, yeah, you can be more dynamic in the sense of going side to side and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But that grip fight, can be when you essentially get past, right? Because if you allow the person on top to set their grips against your legs and you've already lost that grip fight, it's then when you bring, you know, by the time your hands come into play, by the time they're physically close enough for, your, for you to grab them with your hands, it may be too late, right? And, and you know, the pass has already happened or you're already, you know, halfway to getting past. Okay. So how do you win that grip fight? You need to, it doesn't take too long. Sometimes it's only half a second or less, but you just need to survive the hands versus feet grip fight until your hands are within range. And then you set your grips and now it's gone to two arms and two legs versus two arms. So how do you win that grip fight? So really put it simply is pummeling, right? What do we mean by pummeling? If you're not sure, it's like that in Australia, it's at least how they teach you how to tread water. They teach you to like kick your legs like an egg beater, they say, or at least that's what they said when I was a kid, right? It's that sort of circular motion, either at circles outside with your with your feet or inside, mm. right? That's pummeling. And you, if you've trained long enough or if you trained long enough, you will see people doing that as like a warm-up exercise. Yeah, people like do it as a legs. warm-up, exactly. Yeah, yeah. circling the, the, the feet around. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, why would you pummel? Well, because it's going to allow me to either have inside control or outside control of my feet in relation to their arms, depending on what they're doing and what I want to do. But you could even, if you're really new and you're listening to this and you're going, whoa, 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 whoa this already isn't making sense. Just egg beat your legs like a spaz <laughs> until you can grab something with your hands, right? Yeah. The The overall concept here is, win slash survive the hands versus feet grip fight until your hands come into play. So I always, to to make it really clear, is think about it when you're standing. If you stand up with someone, right, and they reach to grab your collar, you might swat their hand away, Mm -hmm. right, before they even get to the collar. And if you're not doing that, you should be. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, right. And I'm going to do the same thing with my feet. If someone goes to grab my, you know, the cuff of my pants or to grab, you know, the pants at my knees or whatever it is, or grab my foot, I'm going to pummel my leg. That's essentially me being like, no, 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 like swatting their their grip away, Mm. right? Until, and then as they get closer, then I can reach them with my hands, set your grips. Now it's four versus two. You could do a whole episode and we probably will on just grip fighting and the importance of grips. I heard this thing, I'm not sure where I heard it from, but it was something along the lines of if you win the grip exchange, if you win the grip fight, rather, you win the exchange. If you win the exchange, you most likely win the position. You win the position, you win the fight. So winning the yeah. establishing the grips that you want and not allowing your opponent to establish the grips that they want when you play it out in a in a match is very, very significant. Yeah. Particularly when you're doing things like stand up, like judo. Grip fighting is the most so, important. So important. Like if you don't win the grips, you lose. Yeah. So winning the grips is very, very significant. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, you could do you could speak for ages just about grip fighting. Yeah. Right. And I re- I remember that you told me this concept 
uh, when I was a white belt, something along the lines of like, say for example, if someone does pass your feet and they get to your knees and they're gripping your in gi, they're gripping your 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 pant legs. Don't let them settle there. Don't let them have those grips that they want. Break the grips. And then another thing that just on what you're saying with with uh, surviving that hand versus feet long enough to get your hands involved, get your arms involved. If you're not doing, this is something that you told me as a white belt. If you're not doing anything with your hands in guard, you're doing it wrong. So there was yeah, moments why where I was just be, exactly. like sitting yeah, back and just often do yeah, that. Yeah, and I was like just relying on my legs. Like, oh, I, I need to use my legs in guard and then ignoring 50% of my body. And as Dana has says, why would you <laughs> Bro, ignore 50% of your body? I actually have quite a fun, uh, I don't know where it is. It's, I, some, I, I'm a terrible person for having, you know, neglecting old photos or videos or something. You mm. go like, oh, I have this photo and then you never find it. Yeah. Like, I did it. <laughs> you wouldn't have that problem. You've got like terabytes of- Oh, I have a lot of terabytes of storage yeah. of uh, everything's archived. But I have a somewhere, have or had a funny of our old mate, Jake, fat Jake, doesn't oh, train fat anymore. Jake. I'm actually, shit, I shouldn't trash talking. I'm going to his wedding soon. But ah, anyway, <laughs> he doesn't listen. He doesn't even know what jujitsu is anymore. Yeah. I've got quite a funny video of like me flat on my back and I'm filming him with my phone. I'm like, just pass, bro. Just pass. And he couldn't. And, yeah. Bro, and he couldn't. And he, like, obviously, it, you know, it, the. He was still relatively new. But, uh, mm. Did he have his blue belt? He might have already had his blue belt. I'm not sure. Mm. But um, anyway, man, and he was like getting so frustrated, yeah, like because he was actually trying. And I'm yeah. filming him on my back. I'm like, come on, Jake, just pass. And you're <laughs> just using your legs. That <laughs> highlights the the power <laughs> of of just using your legs. But if then if you can effectively neutralize someone's passing attempt with just your legs, if you incorporate your arms, then you clearly have the advantage, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, like what on on paper you would, yeah on right? paper of course uh, because. If you're go- if the person on top knows what they're doing, they they should hopefully be quite aggressively trying to win that grip fight as well. Mm. So if we were talking about if we were doing an episode like how to pass any guard, mm. right? Uh, the first point would be win the grip fight, right? Yeah, pretty much. But what I yeah what I say to people is that we all inherently kind of have this. Uh, it's just the way it's phrased when you're talking about guard or passing guard. It's just the way it's phrased is makes you always think that you're going to be in their guard. And I try to say, no, no, that's the wrong way to think about it. Like if I'm passing, if I'm passing, I don't think I'm in your guard and I'm passing it. I go, no, 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 you're in my pass. Mm. Right. As in, you know, it's, it's all happening on my terms. Mm. You're in my pass. You're the one who's trying to not get past and sweat me. It's not me trying to pass your guard. No, no, no. You're in my pass. So if I'm trying to pass, that's my mentality. The same way that when I'm playing guard, I think I've got to set my grips and establish my guard. So I put him in my guard. I, I have that same mentality when I'm passing. You know, I think, I think oh, I've got to set my grips and establish my pass. I've got to put him in my pass. Mm. And that, you know, so it's just 100%. a different way to sort of think engage about it. Engage on your so, terms. Yeah. hundred percent engage so that on your goes, terms. So that goes both ways, right? Yeah. So um, you see it a lot and I've, I've, I'm still guilty of it, but now that I'm aware of it, I, you know, it, it's kind of like once you're aware of something, then you start seeing it everywhere. I'm, I, I see all the time now people just stepping into other people's guards, like allowing them to, to just, instead of like approaching a pass, like aggressively, like I'm going to establish my grips, then I'm going to put this person in my pass, like you were saying. They just sort of walk in yeah. and then all of a sudden and their opponent really likes single leg X. So yeah. they find themselves in that position or, or De La Hiva or, yeah, and or you whatever. It, and, and you're then, like, why? Why and, would you step into their clothes guard? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. And, you, and then the person will, let's say they step in and then the guy establishes, you know, collar sleeve De La Hiva, And then this guy fights for two minutes to break yep. the collar grip mm-hmm. and then goes warm and then does, you know, and then maybe successfully passes. And I'm like, bro, so you just – spent two like doing what yeah. like you spent two minutes just to go back to where you were yep. and then do your pass yeah. like why didn't you just do the pass from the beginning exactly why did you like step it's, in and go here you go have yeah. a collar uh-oh yeah. it's the same <laughs> yeah. like just because this just to bring it back to guard because that's what you know these episodes centered around you can look at the same sort of parallel from people playing guard right and this 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 is an evolution that i'm going through with my guard at the moment just because your air quotes in like playing guard 
doesn't mean you have to play guard, right? If there's an opportunity, you could take the advantage and sit up on it or like stand up. We were doing a specific drill recently where the, the aim of the drill was for whoever was, it was like specific training for comp. So it was 30 second blitz. One person was passing, one person was playing guard. The objective of the person playing guard, they were down on points and they had to get a sweep or submit. And it, I, I mean, I was doing that drill for, for ages until eventually you, you said like, why aren't you like get up if you, if you can, like that is part of the drill. You don't have to just play guard. You can get up and then sweep. Like just because you're playing guard doesn't mean you have to fucking play guard is what I'm saying. So uh, yeah, uh, one like- way to not get your guard passed is to, not play guard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a, that you could perfectly put that into that meme where it's the, um, the meme where it's that, that black guy on the street and he's doing the whole like, eh, like, you know, like oh, he's thinking know, yeah, outside yeah. of the, do you know the meme I'm yeah, talking yeah, about? Yeah. Yeah. Template. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How to not get your guard blast. Don't be guard. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, yeah. It, but I essentially, mean, what I was what I was saying when we were talking about that is, yeah, if it's kind of the way I approach big heavy dudes, you know, it's pretty much collar drags, and I'm going to take the back or whatever. Mm-hmm. But the idea is, if I'm playing guard and I start standing up, right, the person the person who's on top, they only have three choices. They either have to chase me to make sure I can't get up. Mm. They either have to let me stand up and then stand up with me and then the fight's back standing, which you may or may not want depending on your skill and who you're against. Or as I stand up, they sit back on their butt, which would be conceding a sweep. Okay, so yeah, it was like that drill we were doing. Yeah. I was like, bro, like you have to score. Yeah. Like, you know, so if if that means you want to get up and take him down. I mean, last night training with, with Joey, he's we've been working on Joey's guard. Joey's because, a black belt guy. Yeah, yeah. So Joey's guard has been, since his ACL surgery, has kind of fallen by the wayside, that lack of confidence in his knee and mm-hmm. everything. So now we're kind of like, nah, man, let's, it's been too long. Let's go. Let's fix you. Let's get your guard back to where it were, was. And so he was he was sitting playing guard and we kind of had grips, but our legs weren't connected yet. And he essentially just sat up, boom, on a, on a blast, sort of like ankle pick, single leg, double leg sort of thing. Bro, that's a sweep, you yeah, know. Yeah. It's essentially him going, I'm playing guard, but now I'm getting up and doing a takedown, Yeah, right? He just did it from sitting instead and of from standing. Once I took that advice on, because you were yelling it out to me for like a minute before I actually actioned it. But once I did, you know, I, I stood up straight for a collar jack, like yeah. sweep, boom. Yeah. Objective complete. Like Two points, baby. Yeah, two points. Yeah, it makes sense. But if if you're unable to do that, or you don't want to do that or whatever, that, that situation isn't, isn't present. I think concept one, we already discussed keeping your knees to the chest, protect your chest. Concept two was winning the grip exchange, winning the fight exchange between hands and feet. Yeah. Predominantly done via pummeling. Right? Yep. And pummeling is a, is a point that'll, you know, if we went down, started talking about more advanced sort of things. You always pum- come up. Yeah. You're yeah. always, always pummeling. Constantly. Right? And then concept three was once you have survived or won that, feet versus hands exchange, bring your hands into it to make it more or less a four versus two situation. Yeah, and establish your guard. What guard is that? Ah, oh, man, it's up to you. Depends what they do as well, right? Spider guard, De La Hiva, X guard, I don't know, man, whatever. So, so too so many on, options. on that, for someone out there that's like, okay, all right, I understand those concepts. Now I want to, I want to know where to go with this. I need some direction. Like they're coming to yeah. you and saying, ads, what, 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 do I do at this point? What guard should I look to establish or what is a, what is a good place to start there? So, I mean, I'll quickly answer that. I think it's a little going down, you know, a different direction than I wanted to go because we're more sort of now talking about like developing a a guard and learning how to play guard opposed Mm. to sort of retention tips, which is more what I wanted to focus on. But I'll still answer that because you could go, well, the best defense is a good offense, which I also think is true. Right. Uh, I pretty much my general advice for people, the way that jujitsu has developed uh, and where it currently stands, is that I say De La Hiva. And why do I say De La Hiva? You know, you might some people might be thinking, 
especially if some higher belts might be thinking, oh, so De La Heap is a bit outdated, right? Well, yes and no. I, to some degree, De La Heva on its own is kind of outdated. Like it's not a new guard, but there are still people who play it incredibly e- efficiently, like Nicholas Merigali is very well known for his De La Heva guard. But more importantly than that, the reason I'm saying De La Heva is because it's pretty much the central hub for open guard. And open guard nowadays pretty much is guard, mm-hmm. right? Rarely do you see close guard. You'll see some, you'll see like half guard, but it's even then it's more dynamic. It's more things like Z guard and, you know, things like, and things like, like butterfly that. butterfly half. And, yeah, yeah. And, and things like that. So it's even a bit more dynamic than, you know, not many people play even a close guard where they actually close their legs mm-hmm. other than Z guard, which is again, different to just regular half guard. So De La Heap is kind of just that central hub for open guard. So let's say you wanted to go from open guard into X guard. Well, a lot of those transitions are done from De La Heva yeah. into X guard. Yeah, right. So if, using if you De La wanted, Heva to off balance and then go to single leg. Or, yeah, if you wanted yeah. to do sit up guard, well, that's, De La Heva. that's connected to De La Heva. If you wanted yeah. to do spider guard, you know, or there's a transition where you go spider guard into X guard again, right? But it's like a combination of spider guard and De La Heva guard that takes you into X guard. If you want to do bearing bolos, well, it starts with a De La Heva hook, right? If you want to do reverse yeah. De La Heva, that's not going to make a lot of sense if you don't know what regular De La Heva is. So it's kind of like every single other open guard can connect back to De La Heva, mm. but not necessarily the other way around. Like, you know, uh, like X guard to, to, um, reverse De La Heva, like, yeah, can you make a connection there? You can, but like they don't do almost directly connect. If I was, if I, yeah, if I was drawing it out on a mind map and I had open guard, like I almost think of De La Heva as open guard. Like I almost consider them synonymous. Not quite because then you can go down to specific De La Heva techniques, but just that it's position really of – of, you know, it's very natural to have, let's say you're flat on your back, knees to your chest, you win the foot first hand grip fight, then they get close enough for you to make your grips. Your grips are pretty much either going to be on their upper body or their lower body. It's very common for one foot to be, to come close enough because they'll have a staggered stance. You grab that ankle, boom, De La Heva hook goes in. Mm-hmm. Even if you don't play De La Heva, well, look, you're already in De La Heva. Holding that one ankle with a De La Heva hook in, that's De La Heva, regardless of what your other leg's doing. Does your opinion change for Nogi? Or do you still think that there's there's utility to to leveraging uh, De La Heva as the, as the open guard hub, as you say? Don't know. You don't see a lot of De La Heva in Nogi. Mm. It's a bit more grip dependent. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to say like 100% no, because there are people far better than me at Jiu-Jitsu who are trying to develop Nogi, De La Heva, yeah, slash but it's, Bering it's, bolos. Modi- it's modified though. But I don't think yeah, they put their hook in as much. It's a bit different because you've got to worry about the person sitting to the saddle yeah, and yeah. things like that. Uh, I know so- Jeremy Jeremy Skinner uses De La Heva and Nogi, but when he does, he, he keeps knee to knee and he doesn't put that hook he in. Puts, yeah, he like keeps the foot on yeah, the ground. Yeah, and by knee to yeah. knee, for, for those listening, I'm literally saying like literally – your knee on their knee. So yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. it's, it's a De La Heva ish position, but without the hook. And I think that may serve as a better uh, open guard hub, like the same sort of utility that you were describing. Something yeah, to consider. Yeah. It's going to depend with, uh, to some extent, whether you're in the gi or no gi. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So that would be my advice. If you're like, okay, I get those first few concepts, but now what? Mm. Under definitely understand like De La Heva as a whole. Mm. So moving Retention. on that now, okay, so now things are starting to head south. You need to retain your guard, right? Like you said, it's very easy not to get past if you're like, yeah, but I'm already like, you know, sweeping him or something or I'm not playing guard, yeah. right? So we're looking at things are starting to head south. It's time for more analogies. Analogy, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to think about, Frames are a very important part of not getting past, right? So I if I'm talking about if I think about my guard retention, I break it up into into the four frames of like 
my shins more specifically and my forearms, right? They're my four sort of um, big, big portions of, of my frames. And I think about the fact that I want to stay in this mechanically sound, structurally sound kind of cube, right? Not quite a cube because, you know, like my back's on the ground. Mm. But I almost kind of think about my my legs and my arms as scaffolding. Uh, and this is this was never told to me. This is just something that for me made like made sense to me is that I think about it like imagine, you know, imagine a cube that's made out of scaffolding, right? It's just the 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 outsides of the cube, right? That's how I think about my structure of of my frames when I'm playing guard. And the same way that if you took a, a cube or, of scaffolding and you removed one of the struts, right, it then becomes weak in that area, yeah. right? And that's where it would collapse. So, so I think about my frames in the same way. But how do I avoid one frame collapsing? Well, here's where I really think the analogy shines. I think about all-wheel drive in a car. New analogy, got <laughs> New it. New analogy, right? We're on to another <laughs> okay, analogy, right? Everyone forget the scaffolding. <laughs> forget the scaffolding. Leave it in New Zealand. <laughs> That's your frames, right? Your scaffolding's your frames. Got but it. But you've always got to use, if I've got four frames and one starts getting compromised, it's the other three that need to pick up the slack to save it. That's now we're in the car. How all-wheel drive works, right? One wheel loses traction. The other three pick up the slack of that, that one tire that's lost traction. Right? Yeah. You with me? Yeah, I'm you with know you. how all-wheel I'm, I'm, drive I'm works? You. Yeah. Yeah, I'm imagining like a scaffold type car. <laughs> a scaffold car, exactly. So if one of my frames collapses, if one of my legs gets swallowed into a position that I don't want it to be in, it's those other three frames that have to do the work to rescue that leg, right? To get that leg back into a position of traction, mm. right? So I'm always – and, you know – this might be in the beginning kind of like, what, how am I going to do that, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, with time it becomes autonomous. I don't even think about it anymore, right? It's automatic for me if one if one frame or leg or whatever starts getting in danger, the other, the other legs are, you know, my little reinforcements that come in mm-hmm. to rescue it, right? Whereas people often don't realize that, you know, like they'll have, let's say a leg drag is a perfect example. They'll get caught in a leg drag and then they just go like, oh, no, and they try to do some terrible hip escape or something and no, right? Get your knee back to your chest, get that frame back. Yeah, but but also like, you know, one leg saves the other. Like my other leg isn't – is doing nothing. Yeah, comes over the top. Very similar to leg locks, right, and the whole leg entanglement stuff. The reason that you're taught to control the leg that you're not attacking – is because you need to tie up slash occupy that leg so you can dig the heel or whatever because that's the leg they use to escape, mm. right? Their free leg saves their trapped leg. Their free leg saves the leg that you're trying to submit, mm. right? So if, if that leg is left free, they essentially always have that, that defense, right? So it's a similar thing to, to with your guard retention. Shanji talks about this. If So Shanji Huberto – is famous for not having his guard passed in competition since like blue belt. And I believe that still stands. Wow. And he's like a five time world champion, something like that. Heavyweight world champion. And he, he pretty much says the same thing. Like what he was looking, he was explaining it at a seminar. I wasn't at the seminar, but I was just watching a, a video uh, from the seminar. And he's talking about, uh, you know, essentially going from half guard back to, to close guard, right? And he didn't even necessarily teach a technique of, okay, I'm going to do this and then hip escape, blah, blah, blah. But he just talked about the concept of, of one leg saving the other, kind of like, you know, climbing up a set of stairs or climbing up a ladder, right? So if he's, if he's pushing with the left leg, right, he can then, you know, pull the right, leg to his chest to get it further up the person's body or hip or whatever. And then he can push with the right leg to climb the left leg up and then push with the left to, you know, so it's 
and he was that was the the concept he was talking about, like climbing up a ladder or climbing up a set of stairs. If one leg's getting left behind, you like step the other one up, and it's you know it's the left leg pushing down on the step that allows you to bring the right leg up, right? It's not necessarily you pulling the right leg up. So people will kind of, they're getting their left leg swallowed and they just try to pull their left leg back in. No, you push with the right leg. One leg saves the other. And I mean, this is coming from the guy who, yeah, is famously got the, got like essentially the hardest guard in the world to pass, right? So that kind of that whole sort of scaffolding all wheel drive climbing the stairs climbing the ladder clusterfuck of an analogy (laughs) (laughs) for you know i think goes a long long way right when you really start autonomously having your other frames rescue whichever part is is starts getting compromised it goes a long way right and i'll just go back to to kind of you know, to not confuse people too much, right? I only mentioned the the scaffolding because for me it helped me make sense of like being structurally sound. Mm. Right angles, right? Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, like- I was following you, yeah. Yeah, so because this goes the other way when you talk about trying to beat frames. You would have heard me talk about this where a frame is only strong when it's like essentially met at a right angle. So I, you know, always say like if you had- you know, uh, table legs or whatever, mm. right? Yeah, the the legs are holding up the table because they're met at a right angle. But if you, I don't know, if they if they weren't screwed in or something, and you pushed the tabletop, right, the frame collapses. Then, right, mm. when when the legs and the tabletop aren't met at a right angle, yeah. And it's the same with the frame. So when you're passing and someone's framing on your shoulder or chest or whatever, and you turn your shoulders, it strips the frame off. Right. So for me, that whole scaffolding makes sense because I think about like the sh- being structurally sound. Mm. Right. So that's why I was. Yeah. I, I was following. I knew, that. I knew you knew you because I, you've I've heard this yeah, before. Yeah. But, yeah. but, um, but yeah, then, then, you know, but then yes, the I'm structurally was, sound, but yep. of course, even then people start trying to remove pieces of mm. the structure and you've got to bring in the room. When that happens, then the, then the, fo- the all wheel drive concept comes in. <laughs> the all wheel right. drive analogy is when th- when one of your frames is in danger, the other three are there to, to save it. Yeah, to pick you up need, the slack. You need to yeah. use those three to save the one. Yeah, don't just spin that one wheel mm. harder. That's not yeah. going to do anything, yeah. right? And the, the same concept, I know this episode isn't about recovering your guard, but the same concept can be used if your guard gets passed, right? Someone can't really, or it's very difficult for someone to control your shoulders and your hips at the same time. So if your yeah. shoulders are pinned, use your hips to free your shoulders. Yep. If your hips are pinned, use your shoulders to free your hips exactly. to recover yeah. your guard. It's yeah, the it's- same concept, except now it's two to save two rather than three to save one. Yeah. So if you use the concept before you get there, in a perfect world, your guard wouldn't be passed. <laughs> yeah. Or like you said, just don't play guard. Just don't play Problem guard. Solved. Then you can't get passed. <laughs> you can't get passed. <laughs> right? Or so- can you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, so that – um. So that really goes a long way, you know. The one that really sunk in for me was was um, was yeah the way Shanji explained it. Actually, Mm. no, he didn't even explain it that well because you know uh, he didn't have my A grade analogies. Oh yeah, uh, no, but just the way he was, you know, kind of climbing up the ladder. I was Mm. like, yeah, man, and and I well, I still do that now, Mm. and you know, my guard's like unpassable, bro. Like yeah. no one's passed it. Not Ever. even not even that famous guy. Yeah. <laughs> right? that, that one, yeah. <laughs> right. But it it helps a lot. Uh so I've got I mean, I actually have quite a long list of of more things, but I just want to finish on one. Okay. That our I know we've got a, a YouTube commenter that who's who's gonna love this. So now all that makes sense. I really kind of think there's one important thing that that helps bring it together and it's your ability to invert. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, there's, n- you just have to, man, you have to, uh, I find it. There's not many high level professional grapplers now who retain their guard without ever inverting. Mm. Right. Are there things, are there guard retention things you can do that don't require you to invert? Yeah, of course there are. But, uh, your ability to invert is so crucial to your guard retention just simply because 
in a lot of situations as your guard's getting past, right? Like we said at the start, they're trying to get in between that space of your knees and your chest. And a lot of the time, as the pass is developing, the shortest route to get your legs back in between your chest and their chest, right? Because they sent, right? You think if my legs are in between your chest and my chest, you're not side control or mount, mm -hmm. right? Or, or knee or belly. So sometimes the shortest route from to get my legs in between both of our chests is an invert, mm -hmm. right? And the very simple one is that warm up drill, the where you walk around to the head and instead of like, you know, doing a chicken dance 180 to get your legs back. No, you just like stack yourself, put your legs up between up above your head mm -hmm. to get your feet to their hips, right? That's essentially an invert, right? It's a back roll. It doesn't always have yeah. to be an invert, like a bearing bolo invert. An invert can just be like, oh crap, my opponent's essentially north south. Well, by the time I would do a 180, no, he's going to settle in. If I just like back roll and get my legs up between my, you know, above my head, that's a guard. Effectively, um, you're replacing the space where your shoulders were with your legs. Yep, exactly. That is inverting. Yeah. Yep. Learn it. Learn it. Yeah, right? it's super, 100%. It's super important to, uh, you know. Once you can to, do to, it. Once you can do it, it's not like an invert doesn't always have to be this side roll. That yeah, like a is, picture perfect sort yeah, of. Yeah, that's done in, in warm-ups. Man, it can just be putting your legs above your head. Yep. The other reason that's important is because then once you start inverting and your hips start coming off the mat, right, you're, you're able to move your hips a lot more. So yeah. you're able to get a much tighter angle to pummel a leg in, mm -hmm. right? And then once you've got a leg in, that's then one frame that you've put in. And, and then, then that can, frame yeah. can start helping to rescue the other frame. And then you pivot off your shoulders and then all of a sudden you're back in open guard. Yeah. So that helps a lot and it's a skill that everyone needs to learn. I believe, okay, like, oh, I've got herniated discs, I can't invert. Okay, that can be a real thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I don't want to say, well, your guard will never be as good as, you know, so-and-so's because you can't invert. That's mm -hmm. not going to be the case either, right? You could still have a really good guard without having to invert. But, but if the tool is know, available if to the, you. If, yeah. yeah, exactly. If the tool's there, do it. Uh, and then the last thing I, I, I want to say is – then how to help with tying all this together is you use all of these tools to keep the fight in the position that's favorable to you, right? I'll give you a, a perfect example. When I have one particular side of half guard that I absolutely hate, I might have mentioned this on a previous episode, I'm not sure, but I absolutely hate half guard on this one particular side I've tried to get better at it and I've got some techniques from there, but I don't know. I just suck at half guard on that side. Is it your right side? Like if like my right side, yeah. So yeah. if you were passing to your left, yeah. right? I hate playing half guard on that side, right? For me, half guard on that side is pretty much a, a, a short trip to getting past. I'm just terrible at it. I've tried to make it better. So instead, I, I just got really good at – going from half guard on that side back to open guard, right? Which, or back to collar sleeve, which is where I like to be, you know? So all these retention tools I use to take the fight back to where, where I want to be, right? And I'll even do that for half guard on the other side that I like to play and I like to do Z guard on that other side. But, you know, if it's not happening for me, I'll use my retention tools to take it back to a more favorable position. Right, which usually for me, my preferred position would be kind of that open guard collar sleeve sort of position, right? So use your retention skills to keep the fight in the sort of guard that you want it to be in because then it goes back to the very first thing we said at, about winning the grip fight and whatnot is it's happening on your terms, mm. right? And, you know, it's a lot of information there that can also – be relevant and implemented for higher belts, but you know, to keep it a bit more simple, I'll just go back over it again. Okay. So the first thing is understanding your knees to your shoulders, right? You don't, you don't, how can you throw a punch if your arms are already extended? Keep your knees tucked into your chest, right? So they can't fill that space because your legs are occupying it. Then comes the grip fight. 
You need to win that grip fight. You need to win the hands versus feet grip fight until your hands come into play. So now it's four versus two. How do you win that grip fight? Pummeling. Okay. Now, okay, things are starting to go south, right? Your frames, right? You want to be structurally sound like a <laughs> scaffolding cube, right? Structurally sound, okay? Keep, try to keep things at 90 degrees so your frames are strong. But what, what if and when, you know, I should say when because it does, will happen, you know, you start getting compromised. Well, you have, don't just try to like, if my left arm's getting pulled on, don't just pull back with that, push with something else. I have a whole nother body, right, that can rescue that arm. Mm. Okay, again, Shanji sort of spoke about that climbing, you know. The four-wheel drive analogy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. All wheel drive, bro. Come on. All wheel drive. Right. Same so, shit. Yeah. <laughs> right. So one frame, one part of your body starts getting compromised. Bring in the reinforcements to rescue it. Don't Send just in the cow for yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. Don't just leave that guy out in the cold. Yeah. All right. And so you know, one leg rescues another. Okay. Things that okay. What if they just running around my guard or whatever inverts, man? Whichever is the shortest route to get your legs in between you and them. That's the, the route you take. And it's usually some variation of an invert. Not always, but usually. Okay. And then what, what do we do with all this? We use these skills to keep it in a favorable guard position for us. Right. Uh, you know, just to finish with one more example in Nogi, where we briefly mentioned Delaheva isn't super popular. Uh, one thing I like to do is I'll use my retention skills to essentially get to some variation of close guard. And what I mean by some variation is I don't even necessarily want close guard. I just want my legs on the outside of your hips. So then I'm in a position to enter into K guard, right? So I'm using my retention abilities to win the grip fight to, you know, they start pulling on one frame, I rescue it. I might have to invert and all this. And then, you know, I get to that favorable, favorable position for me. And then I can go to K guard or whatever else I want to do. That's obviously a lot of information can be applicable to higher belts as well. But I think for white belts or blue belts who are really struggling with their guard retention, not yet finding it intuitive, hopefully that helps, right? We also briefly mentioned, okay, but now what, what sort of guard? I mean, Delaheva is a great place to start. It's a very central hub of open guard and open guard more or less is guard nowadays. Yeah. So that's a good place to start because everything, if you get a good idea of Delaheva, you can use that to then go to your more specific spider guard or, you know, X guard, whatever you want to do. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that hopefully this episode and, and these concepts more accurately serve to if, if anyone's in the position where they're, they're they're playing guard and they're like fuck now what i'm lost like i'm getting past or whatever just run yourself through that hierarchy run yourself through that list make sure that you're uh you know keeping your knees to your chest make sure you're winning the grip fight winning the exchange use the the, the all-wheel drive analogy because send in the cavalry <laughs> it is it really is send in the cavalry use three to rescue one you know save your limbs and then invert if required when you get more advanced, et cetera. But I think, yeah, really protecting that vulnerable space of your chest and using all of these tools to do it, I think it's a really good place to to start developing an unpassable, impenetrable guard. Yeah, and you know what? The thing that's really good about when you feel comfortable with your guard retention is what, as well is you'll find <clears throat> that that's when you when you understand guard retention – that's when you really start to enjoy guard because I, you could have, you know, hundreds of sweeps and submissions up your sleeve for guard, but maybe not, you don't have good retention mm -hmm. in the sense that like when you shoot that arm bar, but they, but you miss it because they defend it, that you results get in getting your guard pass. Yeah. That sucks. But when you've got really good retention, you start to feel more comfortable to take risks and whatever, like, Again, it would be like a boxer who has gotten to the point where they feel comfortable that, oh, if I throw a punch and they miss it, it's not guaranteed that I'm going to get hit back, mm. right? You know, I imagine 
earlier on in striking, it's probably if you're going against a better boxer, every punch you throw is going to result in you getting punched in the head as well. But we obviously know that's not how it plays out when you watch professional boxers, you know? Yeah, sometimes, you know, the same way sometimes I might go for a triangle, miss it and get past. But as a whole, if I've got good retention, and I feel confident in my retention. Makes your guard more dangerous. Yeah, I'm then much more willing to try my sweeps and submissions because when they fail, I then yep, well, retain my guard, go again, all right? That makes perfect sense. And I think that's an excellent place to leave it. So if you enjoyed this episode, thank you so much for listening. You can support the show by following us on Instagram at beyondjujitsu underscore podcast. And if you want to submit a question to the show, next episode is episode number 70. Every 10 episodes, we do a Q&A. At the moment, we only accept audio questions. That's right. What, audio, what, what type of questions? Uh, audio? Audio. 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 That means the ones you can hear them. You can hear them because it's audio. Audio. That's Submit your audio questions. <laughs> you can do so by the link tree in our Instagram bio. It's the very first link. You can do it on your phone. It's that easy. Yep. So submit your questions. If you want to be featured on the show, you want to hear your beautiful voice on the Beyond Jiu-Jitsu podcast, that is how you do it. Until next time, guys. Laters.